It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur from the CBS television news staff, and Thomas J. Hamilton, chief UN correspondent of the New York Times. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Moorhead Patterson, chairman of the United States Committee for United Nations Day. Well, as we mark the ninth anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, there's a dispute in our country as to its real value. Well, our guest tonight is not only UN Day chairman, but a businessman of international repute. So few persons are better qualified to answer a question, are we really getting our money's worth out of the UN? Well, I think very much so. I, I don't know if anybody knows quite how much the United Nations is costing us, but I've been told it costs somewhat less than half of the amount that's necessary to clean the streets of New York for one year. Something less for each person in the United States than 50 cents. Uh, that is certainly good insurance uh, to, for us, and uh, I think we're getting our money's worth, no question about it. How hard is the UN delegates work, Mr. Patterson? You represented the United States in the disarmament talks in London last summer. You saw them in action. Do they work as hard as businessmen? Well, leaving me completely out of it as far as uh, the working of the thing is concerned, because that's a special case. I think most of the, the people in, uh, in our delegations work around the clock. I mean, they're on the job all the time. They're studying when they're not uh, uh, actually in operation, and they're uh, conferring with other diplomats and talking with them and, and keeping, in, keeping their hands in, get to knowing the people all, all the time. They're really on the job all the time. Perhaps they're overworked, I think, on the basis of any ordinary business, they would be overworked. Probably time and a half for overtime wouldn't do them any harm. Mr. Patterson, despite the amount of work they put in it, there are a lot of charges by some people that the United Nations is ineffective. How do you feel about that? Well, I wonder uh, what they mean by that. It, of course, it depends uh, what the purpose of the United Nations is in each person's mind. Uh, some people say that it's to prevent war. Well, of course, it is to prevent war. But we know perfectly well that nothing in the world can ultimately prevent war if aggressors intend to start a war. Uh, the United Nations it does the best it can under the circumstances. It's already prevented probably seven wars of one kind or another which could uh, lead into larger wars. And I think uh, comparing the cost of it with what those wars would have cost is, shows that really it's, a, it, it's done an effective job. Well, what about a thing like disarmament? You, the, the UN is just uh, about to start some more talks on disarmament with the Russians, incidentally, saying that they're all for it. How do you, how do you feel about that? Well, in the first place, the Russians have always said they're for disarmament. Uh, they say that, uh, they've said that year after year. Uh, they say they're in favor of their type of disarmament. Uh, it's a very simple proposition. They say disarm at once, and uh, that's that. Give up the atomic bomb, all those things. But if you ask them any specific questions, uh, they refuse to answer. We came to the conclusion in London that Russians just don't like to answer questions. Under those circumstances, you can't bring down the specific, I mean, the general things to the specific, and that when you can't do that, well, you don't know where you stand. You don't really know what the propositions mean. Mr. Patterson, do you think the UN would be better off if the Russians were not in it? I certainly do not. Uh, I think that the presence there in the UN of the Russians gives us the greatest possibility of forming an opinion, a world opinion, about who's right in these debates. The debate goes on in the same way that you would have in your trade association. The UN, I think of, uh, a little as if it were a trade association. Now, you know, in America, the development of trade associations uh, has been terrific. 
everybody belongs to a trade association more or less. And what for? You meet with your competitors, you meet with people you don't like, you meet with people you're fighting with all the time, and yet you feel you're getting something out of it just by rubbing shoulders with these people and getting to know more about the way they look on the problems. Uh, why isn't that, doesn't that apply equally to the United Nations? I mean, you see these people from all over the world coming there with diverse and changeable uh, points of view, and that's where we find out how they feel in the hurly-burly and the hard fire of, conf of uh, debate and conference. And we really thrash out opinion there. It's really a, a great thing, a great place to do that. Mr. Patterson, as a businessman, do you think it's possible for uh, this country to ignore world public opinion? I don't, as a businessman or any other kind of a man, I don't think you can ignore world public opinion in the slightest, any more than you can ignore the opinion of the American public. Uh, I don't think that the, if the American public decided, for example, to, to uh, in, the, in, in a good, sensible way, that they wanted to give the whole thing up, I don't think we could stand in the way. Nobody could stand in the way. And the same is true of world public opinion. There isn't anybody that can simply look at it and say, we don't care about that. I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I, I think it's the most important thing with the, that we can find out about in the world. How do you feel about the criticisms of this country, in this country, of the U.N.? Especially, I was thinking of that one in which uh, they say that the United Nations would take away American sovereignty. Well, I have here a, a paper which is called a United Nations Audit, gotten up by the United States Committee for U.N. Day. And it says, in the first place, there are facts that every American should know about the United Nations. It's a very short sheet. It shows, for example, an accounting of the costs and what the United Nations has accomplished. And then it has some facts and fallacies, the kind of question that you asked. And it happens, this is really quite a coincidence, incidentally, that the first fallacy here is that the United Nations threatens to destroy U.S. sovereignty. And I'm going to read the answer to that. The United Nations is made up of independent sovereign states, each one of which is just as intent to preserve its sovereignty as is the United States. The UN cannot make our country do anything it does not wish to do. I think that's a full answer to your question. Well, Mr. Patterson, just what does your UN Day Committee actually do? What we, does it accomplish? We attempt to focus the big efforts of many independent committees, uh, national committees, on United Nations Day, and also to put information about the United Nations in the hands of all those teachers and people throughout the country that really want to know the innards of the United Nations, the last facts about them, the things that, uh, that make the United Nations great or otherwise. In other words, we try to provide people with the information on which they can make up their minds about the United Nations. That is a year-round job. Uh, this year, for example, we have had something like 30,000 requests for information and literature. We've sent out more than three million pieces of literature. And we've had 10,000, we will have on Sunday, 10,000 communities that will celebrate the United Nations Day. Now, that doesn't mean that we are fostering a world government. We're not fostering a super state. We are merely explaining to the, uh, the people of the United States what part the United St uh, Nations plays in their lives and in the lives of all nations in this world. What is your, you, uh, your pamphlets, are they biased in the direction of the United Nations or are you just trying to create a, an informed public opinion one way or the other? Well, we try to keep the, the pamphlets um, absolutely factual. Now, you know uh, what the fellow said. He said, don't give me any facts. My mind's already made up. Uh, sometimes facts aren't facts. Uh, but we try to keep them really facts so that uh, we get to the fellow before he makes up his mind. Well, if the UN can't stop wars, Mr. Patterson, what makes you actually think it is effective? Well, I do think it does stop wars. I didn't say that it couldn't stop wars. What I said was that if if there is an aggressor around 
who's just bound and determined he's going to have a piece of somebody else's real estate. Uh, there's only one way to stop him, and that's shoot at him, unless you can talk him down. But once he's gotten ready to move, well, there's nothing else to do but shoot. Now, uh, if you talk, though, you can always delay things a long, long time, and perhaps forever, and that the United Sta Nations has done on numerous occasions. Well, Mr. Pedersen, if there were no UN, would it be possible to carry on the uh, negotiations that do go on through ordinary channels of diplomacy, through uh, whispering into people's ears rather than into public microphones? Well, uh, very likely you could carry it on. It was carried on for many, many centuries that way. But does, let's remember this one thing, and that is that the United Nations is a part of a great scheme of diplomacy, of a great scheme of the of the interplay between ourselves and our government and other governments throughout the world. It's only one of the, of the various schemes. We also have uh, conferences of all kinds, and we have our ambassadors in all these capitals. And under the circumstances, it is one of the very important ways in which we keep uh, on top of public, of world opinion. Well, I want to get back to the fact, Mr. Patterson, you are actually a businessman. So I would like to ask you this. Do you think that the United Nations is a good place to sell this country to the world? You know, the way you talk about, the way you pronounce the word businessman, <laughs> it sounds like some sort of a peculiar animal that isn't, is different from everything else. Well, uh, maybe he is, but uh, uh, I would rather just say from the point of view of myself as an American citizen that just looks around and tries to to uh, keep things going, that, that our people in the United Nations are doing a perfectly fine job of selling this uh, country. I really think that we do get it across in a big way. And I think if they're backed up and if people don't, uh, uh, don't shy too many uh, things at them, that they will carry through and will make a good world opinion. But they're really in there fighting. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to have you up here tonight, Mr. Patterson. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Thomas J. Hamilton. Our distinguished guest was Moorhead Patterson, chairman of the United States Committee for United Nations Day. To own a Longines watch is to own one of the very finest watches made anywhere in all the world. And yet, unbelievably, a Longines watch is not expensive. There are many outstanding models of Longines watches priced as low as $71.50. The choice of styles and of models is almost unlimited. For ladies, Longines creates superb examples of the jeweler's art, exquisite in taste and finish, perfect for every dress and for every occasion. For men, Longines produces watches for every requirement, watches for dress and for sport. Longines Automatic Watches, the most advanced in the world. Longines Waterproof and Shock-Resistant Watches for Rugged Service. Longines Chronograph Watches for Sportsmen and Scientists. And every Longines watch, whether for a lady or for a gentleman, is made to the unique standards of excellence which have won for Longines 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. And this statement is true throughout the world. The Longines watch on your wrist is not only one of the finest watches made anywhere in all the world, but equally important, it's the watch of highest prestige. Yet, unbelievably, you may own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character.